Okay, so I'm watching people starting to click in. So as you're clicking in, I see um, quite a few people have just started to sign in. So I, oh, I see that there's a question already. So that's good. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask the people who are signing in, if you could go to the function that's a Q&A down on the bottom, could you please um, send a little note to me that says, yes, you can see the screen. Yes, you can see can two right presenters. Um, yeah, so you're fine, Carl. I'm just asking uh, the participants. I want to make okay. sure that they can see us. And I'm asking the participants if they can hear us because, you know, an hour later, we would have been talking to ourselves. And, um, oh, okay, so I got somebody that says, I can see you, I can hear you, I can see you, I can hear you, I can see the screen. Yay! Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much for that response. That's really helpful because we can't, this is a, you know, a webinar and we can't see you. And, um, you know, that would be a really sad result 60 minutes later <laughs> if, if we had, um, we had been in, in um, you know, in the blank. So as you're signing in also, one of the things that's been really interesting for us is to find out where you are from. So if you feel comfortable sharing that information, just your town or your location, um, that would be really great because, you know, we were doing a program the other night and there was someone from North Carolina, there was someone from England, Kent. And so, um, you know, it's always interesting for us to see where, where you're from. So if you'd like to add that, that would be, that would be great. Um, so I'm getting some responses here, uh, and that's really interesting for us. So thank you for, for doing that if you're so inclined. We're going to be starting the program in about two or three minutes. We're just waiting for more people to get queued in. Um, and so I'm glad that you can see our screen. I'm so glad that you can see Carl Cucciera, our presenter for today, whom I'll introduce in just a few minutes. And, um, and you're seeing the welcome the welcome screen as well. Um, okay, great. Yeah, this is really helpful. Thank you so much for all of your responses. So we have uh, Carl, just so that you know, I know that you're not following this. Um, there's uh, someone from uh, Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. There's someone from Sussex, New Jersey. Uh, there's a true confession here from someone who says that she's from Basking Ridge and oh my goodness, she's never been to Duke Farms. So this will be a great introduction to Duke Farms. So uh, thank you for sharing with that with us, Miriam. Um, so let's see who else we have. Okay. So I'm going to answer this question. And I want to make sure that people can see my response as I answer it. See if that works. There's a question from um, from Kathy about um, a raised hand, and in this function, I cannot see a raised hand. So I can only so Kathy, this is out to you if you're listening. I can't see your hand raised in our function the way that it, our program is set up, but I can see your question. So if you want to uh, answer, or excuse me, if you want to pose a question and type it in, I can see it that way, and you can send it to the group or you can send it also to me. I should be listed as uh, Kay Riley. I'm your facilitator, the facilitator today. So um, we're going to go over some of the housekeeping uh, parts of the program in just a few minutes also because in all the ones that I've attended, they're all a little different. So um, some of the Zooms are, are a little bit different than the, the webinars. So, okay. So let's see. 
Why don't we wait just another 60 seconds, Carl? Is that okay with you? Yeah, no problem. Take your time. Okay, great, great. Well, I don't want the people who are here on time, I don't want to have them wait too long. So I usually wait about three minutes because sometimes it's a little tricky to get all signed in and clicking and all of that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> okay. Okay, I'm just clearing some things off my screen. And let's see, it is 3.02, so I'll just wait for 3.03 and then we will get started, which it is now. So thank you for, for waiting those few minutes as people uh, sign into this webinar. As you can see, you've joined the Duke Farms program, Understanding the Present Through Postcards from the Past. My name is Kate Riley, and I am the manager of education here at Duke Farms. For those of you who are new, and I know that there's somebody out there who's new, uh, and also as a refresher, Duke Farms encompasses 2,470 acres dedicated to conservation, dedicated to preservation, and dedicated to ecological research. About 1,000 acres is open to the public. There are 18 miles of trails for exploration and fun. And there you can see also our efforts in sustainability. The mission of Duke Farms is to inspire our visitors to become informed stewards of the land. And if I could hear you, you might ask, well, how do you do that? So typically, Throughout the year, we offer about 300 classes or more for toddlers, little wee ones, all the way up to adults and uh, people who look like me and beyond. Uh, the classes are generally low cost and, and or free. Um, and because that is part of our mission to make sure that people understand all of the resources that we have. And we just want people to be inquisitive and curious and learn more about the environment. Right now, Obviously, we're offering our classes virtually through uh, webinars and also Zooms. And we also have a distance learning portal that's located right on our homepage. And if you haven't been, um, been there checking it out, I think it's something that you might like to do. There is about 70 plus resources right now for families, for non-formal educators, for uh, teachers, some of the resources are tied to the next generation science standards and to, and to other standards, multidisciplinary, but there are activities and really fun things uh, for you to do. So after the program, we hope that you go back into the distance learning portal and kind of check it out. Um, for housekeeping, I've gone over a couple of things, but we can't see you, unfortunately. You can, you can see us, hopefully, and uh, from the response, I think you can see us. I'll be looking at that question uh, aspect on your toolbar. You can pose a question to the group. I generally collect all those questions, and if we have time, we may be able to get Carl to answer them uh, for us. If we don't have time and there's something that is really important, uh, you can email me directly at kreilly, R-E-I-L-L-Y, at dukefarms.org or you can uh, leave it in that question and answer. I'm gonna gather all of those up and then we could send an email out to you all uh, as well. So that's kind of the housekeeping aspect and we just want you to sit back and really have a great time. And every time I listen to Carl, I learn something new. Carl Cucciera is a career educator. He's a member of our small but mighty education team at Duke Farms. Uh, Carl's known for many things. He's known as a world traveler. He's definitely known as a research rat. So he's always digging around for fun facts and interesting things to share. He adores history and the arts and the environment, but he's also a very social being. So if you've ever been to Duke Farms, I 
can probably think that you know already. And if you haven't been to Duke Farms, Coral is a reason that you should come and visit us soon. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Coral Cucciera, and we're going to um, we're going to get rid of you, Carl, so people can't see you anymore. And then um, you'll be able to start your slideshow. How's that? Sounds good. You want to say hello before I? Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hope I can live up to that introduction, Kate. Thanks. Okay. Well, most of it was true. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to stop your video, Carl, and then you're in charge of your slides. And here we go. Very good. All right, now you're well, just a big C on our, on our board, so. Um, I can only go through life like that. There you go, so take it away. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to Duke Farms, or as you can see from the slide, from the postcard, is it Duke's Park? If you have not visited our humble parcel of land here in beautiful Hillsboro, New Jersey, or even if you have strolled every trail, we hope when all is done, you come away with a deeper appreciation of all that has been done in the past that has transitioned us to what we are doing in the present. I have been a visitor education assistant here at Duke Farms the last seven years, but I moved to Hillsborough in 1989, and I always wondered what was on the other side of that wall off of 206. When I told my mother that my wife and I lived just a stone's throw from the Duke estate, I was shocked that my mother knew almost every detail of the life of Doris Duke. This definitely piqued my interest. Having taught Italian and studied in Italy, the structures I saw reminded me of the old country. I was soon to learn that this boulder type entrance in the first slide was indeed done by Italian immigrants, as were many of Duke's buildings and gardens and quarried very close by. I want to thank Tom Amendinger, Duke Farms Director of Natural Resources and Agroecology. Tom introduced me to this treasure trove of past postcards buried in some digital cave. Okay. It's not moving, Kate. Hmm. Okay. Let me, let me, should I get the video off? Yep. Let's see. How about now? Nope. I'm on. I don't know why it's not moving. Okay. Hang oh, on. Here it is. It moved. It moved. There you go. All right. Thank God. Okay. All right. This is our present entrance, I guess, Duke Parkway West. Um, you can see the growth. We're going to talk about that later. But what really bothers me is what are we doing with these telephone poles? What a shame. Let's go back. Let's go back to the way life used to be. Um, I studied in Italy and Spain, no telephone poles, no lines. But this is what you'll see as you enter from 206 onto Duke's Parkway West. A little history here, James Buchanan Duke on the left, JB or Buck to his friends, selected Hillsborough, New Jersey for the same reason Rick told Captain Renault why he came to Casablanca. Do we have any Casablanca movie fans out there? Okay, I'll give you the answer. Rick said, I came for the waters, remember? And Captain Renault said, waters, what waters? We're in the desert. And Rick said, I was misinformed. But JB was not misinformed. The waters here were the Raritan River. When most of the wealthy moguls of the Gilded Age were building mansions along the Hudson or out on Long Island, JB came to Hillsboro with the intention of establishing a working farm. JB Duke was born and raised on a humble farm in North Carolina. After the Civil War, when most of the farm was in ruins, his father directed all their efforts to raising tobacco, a unique variety of tobacco called Bright Leaf. I'm a movie fan, so there is another movie out there starring Gary Cooper called Bright Leaf that is loosely based on the life of J.B. Duke. J.B. was a tireless worker and entrepreneur who guided the family's fortunes. Acquiring the patent, to the cigarette rolling machine and increasing the smoking world by putting stylishly dressed women and professional athletes on his packets, coupled with his business acumen, his wealth rapidly increased. He established the American Tobacco Company and moved his offices to New York City. In 1893, he bought 40 farms off the banks of the old Raritan 
Besides the water, the convenience of the railroad in Somerville was also an incentive for choosing, choosing this locale. The land was originally occupied, as many New Jersey geographic location names imply, by Native Americans. The early European settlers in this area of New Jersey were Dutch, bringing with them their methods of land management and, of course, their plants. Many of their original drainage ditches were still until recently visible. How did the local population view this new arrival? We do know that JB played an active role in the community here and in his church. Though his initial desire was to create a farm, this vision changed around 1899. We are not sure if his travels abroad or it could have been his desire to emulate the many grand estates of the wealthy in the United States and Europe. But for the next approximately 12 years, he completely changed the landscape of the farm. He eventually acquired over 2,200 acres. He enlisted the services of architects Kendall Taylor and Stevens in Boston, which he had seen in, seen their work in North Carolina, and various landscape architects, one of whom, James Greenleaf, had an association with the Biltmore Estate being built by the Vanderbilt family in Asheville, North Carolina. J.B. wanted the topography of Duke Farms to reflect the Piedmont area of his North Carolina. He purchased over 2 million trees and bushes. The estate eventually would include seven connected lakes, six waterfalls, and 35 fountains. Hey, when he died in 1925, yes. Um, what they're seeing right now is, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, but they're not they seeing? seeing your slideshow as the full screen. They're uh -huh. seeing, yeah, they're seeing um, the big C there, but yeah. they're not seeing your slideshow. So could we, um, I'm going to go back to uh, the video, uh, putting you back on video. Okay. Um, and maybe that. Uh, they, don't, they don't see the picture of J.B. Duke and Doris. Yeah, it's a tiny little thumbnail. So it switched your, it's like you're just a big C right now. You're not, oh, there we she. go. So is that better? I'm wondering if somebody can tell me whether that's better or not. Got it. Okay. So but I don't know. Better. Yeah. So I guess we're all set. I just see, um... Can somebody just make sure that you can still see the screen, the slideshow? Uh, I don't want you to get started unless. Sure. Uh, so it should be JB Duke and Doris, the whole screen. Yeah, I'm just waiting for someone to let me know. It's good, great view. Okay, wonderful. Sorry for the interruption, but no, um, no. who wants to look at a big C? So there you go. Okay, that's so much Great. better. Thanks, Carl. No problem. Okay, so we're talking about Doris now. Yeah. When, when JB died in 1925, his 12-year-old daughter Doris acquired the bulk of his estate. Doris, a world traveler, journalist, musician, collector of art, and lifelong philanthropist, always considered Duke Farms home. She was an environmentalist before the term was invented. When she died in 1993, she left her fortune to creating the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. The foundation supports through grants to improve people's lives, child well-being, the arts, social, cultural issues, health, education, and of course, the environment. Ms. Duke explicitly expressed that Duke Farms served to foster her love of nature. Today, I usually do a walking tour, so bear with me. Today, our tour will follow a walking path that hopefully will introduce this environmental gem for the first time and to the many time visitor aspects that will provide a new appreciation for the past and the transition to the present. have this old 1860s map shows many of the original farmsteads that now make up Duke Farms, but also the true personal pride these early farmers had of their land. There are many more drawings that surround what you see. 
One can only guess how these landowners felt about this North Carolinian, this Tar Heel, moving in. But money talks, except for one family, the Elmendorf family. They held on to their centrally located 88 acres of land. JB eventually acquired the land where the Elmendorfs could continue to live in their house for the duration of their time on Earth. Okay, this shows basically the present day map, almost 2,700 acres that is presently Duke Farms. Some sections still maintain the names of the early farmers. I think that's a great tribute to the past. Okay, this is presently our map we call the core. We're gonna be starting in the lower bottom. You see that farm barn with those loops behind it. We're gonna start our tour there. Then we're gonna cross Duke's Parkway West and enter the core. This is the farm barn, the lower postcard right there. Um, and above we have the orientation center. Closed now due to the pandemic. Once normalcy returns, this is where you will park and learn about the historic background, current activities, and have lunch in our unique cafe, which now, by the way, is open for outdoor dining. As you sit eating your beet salad, you must remember mm -hmm. that J.B. Duke built this farm barn first as a horse barn. The architecture reflects the Queen Anne, Jacobethan, Norman architecture of Northern France and Southern England. As you saw from that last map, the outline of a racetrack, now a walking path is still evident behind this structure. Doris later converted the building to a dairy farm Today, this building houses not only Duke employees, but also some offices of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Now look closely at the postcard. You will see a large chimney. See it? Today, no chimney required. The Farm Barn is LEED certified. That's an acronym for Leader in Energy and Environmental Design. It is designated a platinum certified building the highest designation. Ooh, I'm excited. It is connected to two and a half acre solar array, geothermal wells, recycled building materials, water derived from wells, and many other improvements that make for a healthier indoor and outdoor environment. We at Duke Farms are very proud of this difficult to achieve designation. Most visitors are impressed. We do have visitors that come from Germany and they never fail to inform me that all new construction in their country must meet some level of leads and that 30% of all Germany's energy comes from renewable sources. We will now leave the farm barn, as I said before, walk across Dukes Parkway West and enter JB Dukes Park, which we now call the core. As we enter, immediately to our left, we will find Dukes Brook the only natural water source on Duke's farm. Here we encounter the first effort of JB, see the lower postcard, to convert the land into a manicured prop property. Duke Farm's current efforts are to return the land to a more natural environment. We encourage habitats, food sources for the many animals, birds, and reptiles that can now be seen throughout the core. The weather is sunny and warm, which has been lately. You will be greeted by turtles who bask on the nearby logs. One of our many initiatives is to rid the property of invasive plants. They often discourage pollinators, do not add to the health of the soil, and can overtake an area having no natural animals to keep the growth in check. This is extremely difficult to do. We have a habitat restoration team that takes great pride in ridding the landscape of invasive while introducing native plants. Okay, this postcard reveals one of the many well houses that dotted the property, isn't that beautiful? This introduces us to one of the recurring mysteries of Duke Farms. Why was this and so many other beautiful structures and fountains removed? Look above at today's photo. Both shots view Central Way, the main artery of Duke Farms. Central Way is now lined with London Plain and American Sycamore trees. You can just make out 
in the photograph, that hay barn, which we're going to get a little closer look at. All right, to the right, that's what it looked like when it was complete in 1902. The hay barn with its arches and buttresses burned down in 1915. Doors prevented it from being knocked down and converted it into a statue garden. Notice the beautiful outside sculpts, the sculpted stones and the rough, if you can see it, you'll be a better view, broken inside stones. Obviously, the inside was never meant to be viewed as it is today. Do we have any Rutgers grads out there? We do, Old Queens, the old administrative building. If you see it, the front beautiful stones, they ran out of money. The back of the building is just as what you see on in the inside here. We still maintain, Duke Farm still maintains a close association with Rutgers University. But the question was, where were these statues before? Ah, the Three Graces, my favorite. Where were they? And if you see behind, you can see the rough hewn uh, stones. That's what we'll attempt to find out next. We're going to walk through the less traveled research woods path that was the first fenced area of the core. Here, various, various trees and bushes were propagated in the nursery. In the last few years, this nursery has made a comeback. It is here that many native plants are cultivated for planting on the property. Hey, notice the three graces in the postcard down, down below. Tom was a great help here in locating a garden that has long since vanished. The postcard shows what was then called a parterre tier garden. For those fortunate enough to have visited Versailles and can speak a little French, that was the summer home of the French kings. The gardens behind the palace all project a beautiful symmetry. Our current photo shows the outline of a path in addition to the less developed woodlands in the background as a hint compared to the more mature trees that you see across the path. But there's more, more clues. To help reinforce our theory of the statues alongside the above current photo buried in the woods are remnants of, a, of cold frames. These were concrete boxes that served to cultivate plants that would then be removed to the parterre garden. The thinking back then was plants being raised close by to the soil where they would be moved would help ensure their development. You see that on the left, even a tree is growing through one of those now. Plant cultivation has, has indeed changed from the early 1900s as evidence of what looks like to the right, a trunk of a tree Closer inspection reveals a concrete monolith. There are many of these monoliths that can be found here in Research Woods area. Again, Tom pointed out the copper piping that still can be found on top of these cement monoliths. Back in the day, many thought like rain from above was the best way to water the plants below in the nursery instead of now bringing water closer to the roots. Uh, not too much has changed. This is a beautiful conservatory taken recently, this photo, built in 1899. It's called the Orchid Range. It is modeled after Kew Gardens, found outside of London. Miss Duke long had a first fascination with orchids. Though many plants were cultivated here over the years, during Doris's time, it was primarily for her orchids. There was a variety of orchid named after her. Our regular visitors know that this is, this is the second building on the property that has received the lead designation, in this case, gold. Uh, my favorite building, mm -hmm. this building, the coach barn. Look at the, the postcard below. And I love the postcard because there's a little message down below, you know, hope I can see you soon. Come visit me here. The Coach Barn was the first building built in 1900 by the architects Kendall Taylor and Stevens and continues the style of the previous structures. Topping of this building is a Norman clock tower that still chimes the hour each day. A major outside renovation was done a few years ago, maintaining the integrity of the siding and the shale roof. From old postcards such as these, they were able to construct a copy of the original weather vane 
long since lost to posterity. As the name implies, it once housed coaches, horses, then cars. Horse stalls are still present in the building. JB also had his office in the far left corner and conducted all farm business there. If in the future we are able to enter, you would be able to see on the immediate inside walls murals of the four continents. Straight ahead, that's North America. JB obtained the service of a local Somerville artist, Orville Lance. Now you see it, now you don't. Another mystery. The postcard shows a fountain. The postcard below shows a fountain that was located across from the coach barn. This was easier to locate since it sits in front of a statue of Bull Dorm. Closer inspection of the postcard reveals frogs spritzing water. Thus, this was called the frog fountain. The bull and the fountain sat directly across from JB's office. Once JB acquired the Blackwell Tobacco Company, a formal rival, he had their symbol, this bull, parked where he could view it on a daily basis from his office. I wonder why. We will now take the turtle path directly behind the bull that will pass a few lakes and meadows that will lead us to our next stop. We will return to these meadows soon to solve another mystery. This well house on West Way remains as a tribute to JB's attention to detail. Opening the park to local visitors early in the 1900s, there was the issue of available water. This water fountain was one of few that still remains. The beautiful stone arches, the inside vaulting, reminded me on a much, 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 much smaller scale of the massive cathedral ceilings of Europe. Here again is a comparison of the manicured lawns of JB's day and the sustainable, environmentally friendly meadows we have today. Let's take a stroll up West Way. Hey, the postcard, beautiful bridge with beautiful fountain behind it. This bridge crosses the Great Lake, Great Falls Lake. Missing in the postcard are the catalpa trees you see above that now line the bridge on both sides. Also missing in the photo, though difficult to see, is perhaps one of the past most beautiful fountains and waterfalls. There once was a tunnel that went under the falls that has long since been removed. Hey, okay. this is one of Duke Farm's best attractions, the Great Falls. In JB's time, they were called Silver Cascades like all the other water features, except for, you remember, Duke's Brook. This is a man-made feature that is turned on four times a day, little after 10, 12, two, and four. Now is the time to talk about the Duke Farms water system. The landscape artist, architects devised a method where the water from the Raritan River was pumped into a reservoir that is located just above the falls approximately 81 feet above the height of the river. The various lakes, pools, and fountains all sit at lower levels until the water eventually flowed back out into the river cleaner than when it came in. This also provided water to all the residences through a pump and filtration system in the town of Raritan on the other side of the river. Today, our water comes from wells dug on the property. Also, J.B. Duke invested heavily in hydroelectric power and brought this new source of energy to Duke Farms by a series of dams and a power station located alongside the pumping station. He was instrumental in bringing electricity to the South and forming the Duke Power Company. Okay. In this current photo of the falls, I just wanna know how nature has almost completely obscured the view that was seen in the early postcard. Okay, we're gonna take a little stroll down from the waterfall and we're gonna encounter Doris Duke's own private pool. You can see below in the postcard, this was the mermaid pool. In the recent photo above, the mermaids have long since returned to the sea. 
in the center, we find a pineapple fountain that still functions today. The pool's water is furnished by that same reservoir directly above across West Way to the right. In the current photo, you might be able to make out the floating islands. These help remove nitrogen from the water, thus inhibiting the growth of duckweed. Okay. From this pool, we're gonna to turn to our left. We see this beautiful bridge. It's between Great Falls Lake and Vista Lake. Look below. Reminiscent of old English bridges, it was constructed by relatively new material. At the time, developed in England called Portland Cement. Very durable. This is one of 54 bridges on the property, but by far the most impressive. This bridge will lead us to the old foundation. To the left, that's not a postcard of the old foundation because the foundation, the, the mansion was never completed. Construction was begun in 1911 with the landscaping having, having been done prior. Here, JB enlisted the services of an architect, Horace Trumbauer. Trumbauer had worked on the Biltmore and this mansion style was to have been done in the same French Renaissance style. After completing the two level basement, you see to the right, construction was stopped. Question, could it have been his growing business interests in Great Britain or possibly his disgust when the antitrust laws broke up his American tobacco company? I kind of lean to the third choice, his second wife, Nanaline Holt Inman, Doris's mother, who longed for the more refined life of Manhattan, London, or her native North Carolina. It's the romantic in me. And that's another quote from the movie Casablanca. So, sorry. What I also find interesting is that, just as with Versailles, the front would not have been as awe-inspiring it would have been the back with its great lawn that today we call the great meadow that would have demanded our attention. We're concluding our little stroll. We're going back over the bridge and we're going to look to our right. As you can see, definitely the topography has changed. The growth along the edge you know, helps deter Canada geese, makes the, the lake healthy. But there is a mystery here, and I, and I think you can help me. Look to the postcard down below. Look to the back. Looking in the distance, you might be able to make out the tower of one time Duke's largest fountain complex, long since remo removed. Do you see it, that little white tower in the back? To the left, that's the postcard. The biggest, the biggest fountain in, at Duke Farms in its time. What a beautiful fountain this must have been. I'm sure early visitors spent many hours by its waters, but where was it? Looking at a 1930s map, it was somewhere in the, of the vicinity of our Arboretum, possibly in this open meadow. New Jersey's meadows were first created by Native Americans for raising crops and hunting deer Ensuing European farmers fell trees to increase the productivity of the land. Here at Duke Farms, we hope to maintain the meadows, growing native plants, attracting pollinators, bringing nitrogen to the soil, and encouraging habitats, especially for nesting birds. If you happen to be a birder, we are a birder's paradise. Another mystery coming up. This was called the Fisk Fountain, one of the few bronze fountains on the property. The postcard reveals one of the unique fountains that once were all over the property. But look what I've discovered on the right. Strolling on a rarely strolled path just past Dragonfly Pond in the direction of the coach barn, I came across this bronze base filled with water with an open pipe in the middle. At first, this would not appear strange, except for the fact that it is always filled with water. And just a few feet away, 
are the remnants of a stone well that is almost always dry. Tom told me that this is evidence that this bronze is connected to the water flow that fills our lakes and fountains. What do you think? On our last slide. This statue, Doris called her blue boy, but in art history, it's called the thorn extractor. Isn't that beautiful, another fountain well in the back. I just threw this in because it's my favorite and I control the PowerPoint. <laughs> it is a bronze copy of a Roman marble copy of a Greek statue. With a few art history courses under my belt, I love the attention the early Greeks gave to the problem of a young boy making his pulling out a thorn in his foot to live for eternity. Visiting Italy two years ago, my wife and I fought the hordes of tourists wherever we went, elbowing, elbowing our way down the halls of Florence's Uffizi Art Gallery. There he was, at the end of the hall, all by himself. The hordes ignored him in search of a Michelangelo or a Botticelli. I felt I had recognized an old friend. I was the only one who sympathized with his predicament. Thank you, JB. Thank you, Miss Duke. I would like to end with a few other thank yous. I want to thank Kate Riley, our education manager, manager who encouraged me to take my postcard hike in my first Zoom class. Thanks, Kate. Joanne Vogel, who has been involved with Duke Farms for many years, her most recent, in her most recent capacity as an education environmentalist. Debbie Thomas, who has not only worked at Duke Farms in a variety of capacities, but also grew up on the other side of the Raritan River, close to all the action. And especially QP Singh. QP, who was an assistant and event planner of Doris Duke, always referring to her as Miss Duke. QP had a passion and a certain class that epitomized in my mind how we all should treasure this special gift from Miss Duke. And lastly, of course, Tom Amendinger, Duke Farms Director of Natural Resources and Agroecology, without whose help, my postcard hike would not have been possible. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. So, um, Carl, I've turned your video back on. Okay. Am and um, you are visible. So I want to thank you so much. And um, once again, if there are um, any other questions, you can certainly send them along to, to me, Kay Riley, at dukefarms.org. Um, I will make sure that we get them to Carl. And uh, for those of you who have been to Duke Farms, hopefully this is another view of things. And when you come back, you can see things through another lens, another set of, of, of eyes. And if you haven't been to Duke Farms, if this doesn't give you a reason to come and visit us, I don't know what does. It's a beautiful property, a glorious property, a wonderful staff, and we're all about education. So if you have any other ideas for future programming or if there's something that piques your interest on the distance learning portal, or maybe you've seen another Zoom out there and you think that maybe it would work here at Duke Farms, I'd love to hear from you. So with that, I'm signing off and I want to thank everyone and um, hope to see you soon. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. Thanks, Kate.